But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So did What's persecution make you think of? What's an antonym for persecution? Do you know what antonym is? First of all, opposite, just so we're clear. According to uh, theosaurus.com, the opposite of persecute is to aid, assist, delight, make happy, help, protect, comfort, soothe, cons console or console, reward. The church faced persecution because they believed in Jesus Christ and His way. What Bonnie said got me thinking. She said that um, all those cloudy days, whether there's rain or not, makes her appreciate when the sun comes out. But let me tell you something. If you can look beyond the clouds, the sun never changed. If you can look beyond the persecution and the trials and the tribulations in your life, God is there shining His grace on you every single day. And in fact, He lives in you and lives through you. So you know what? It doesn't matter if it's gloomy outside or not because you should be shining so that the world can see you. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your word, the time that we can come together. We praise you in the sunshine and in the rain. Lord, when it is gloomy and everything, we know that you use all things to draw us to you. We thank you and praise you that you have loved us and that you have filled us with your Spirit. Lord, we thank you that as we're reading along, we can see the persecution that came to believers for following Jesus Christ. But yet your church grew. Even in the persecution that spread people, that was a way that gave them an opportunity to travel further, to get out of their comfort, to tell others about Jesus Christ. Lord, may we be lights of this world. May we bring glory and honor to you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I think there's a football game going on today too, right, Barry? Somewhere, somewhere, there's two teams playing. You know, once I used an analogy or a sermon illustration or whatever you want to say of a football team. And then after that, and how we're, you know, got to follow the coach and we're part of the team and so forth and makes for a good example. But then after that, I talked about us being soldiers fighting a battle. And after that sermon, I got kind of reprimanded. I got told that my example of the team he, he really liked, but he didn't like the example of the battle. Well, I got news for you, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Scripture says we fight a battle. That's why we have to put on the armor of God. And if you don't realize that or you don't like that, if it offends you, then you need to dig out your Bible and read a little bit more so that you'll know that it is not by your strength or your might, that it is not just a game that we're playing, that it is a battle and Satan is waging for souls for people of all eternity. He wants to rob them of worshiping God and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I entitled this sermon... Last week I said, who would you choose? And showed you how the world chose Barabbas, and that was maybe a choice that seemed logical at the time. This week I asked, well, would you be willing to die for the one that you choose? And let me tell you something about that. You will die for the one you choose. Because we are fighting a battle. This is not a game. There are eternal consequences. You need to figure out who you've chosen, who is the captain of your team, who is the commander-in-chief, who is the king of all kings, and you need to follow him with the breath of life that he's given you, with the new life that he has given you in Christ. But you know, Jesus never asked you to die for him. He didn't ask you that. He asked you if you'd be willing to lay down your life 
for Him. You know what? That's a good bit harder, isn't it? <laughs> that means each and every day I need to lay down my life as a willing sacrifice, giving up my own so that I can live for Him. Dying is just a one-time event. You've got to decide what you're going to do in that heat of the moment, whether you'll die for someone or not. But giving up your life every single day to live for them, for their gain instead of your gain, for their will instead of your will, that's totally different. That's a lot tougher. And the only way that you can do that is the power of the Spirit, and that's why Jesus sent His Spirit. And as you've been reading this week, you'll see that Peter is definitely a new creation in Christ now, isn't he? But don't get sidetracked on that. Realize that every believer is a new creation in Christ. They faced the same persecutions and turmoils. They sold their property because they didn't consider it their own. They decided that this life meant nothing unless they could give it up to serve Jesus and His way. To lay it down. To lay your life down doing what? Fighting for the kingdom of God. Fighting for souls so that the devil will not get a foothold so that you can bring glory and honor to God, so that you can direct souls homeward to this kingdom called heaven, where Jesus is Lord of Lord, King of Kings, and you either claim your allegiance and are fighting for Him, or you're not. It is a battle. Who is your King? What if I brought a gun to church today? I was going to, but I forgot to. Would you freak out? What if we were in a hostile situation somewhere and your life was threatened? Would it be nice if I had a gun then to protect us? No? It depends on how you feel. But let me tell you this part of it. What if I brought that gun to protect us and I didn't bring any ammunition? Right? Right? So many times we wear the banner of Jesus Christ, but we're not reading His Word. We're not fellowshipping together. We're not praying. We're not asking Him to increase our faith. It's no different than me having a gun here to protect us and not have any ammunition. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10, this is after um, Paul talks about how we should live as servants, as submissive, he says in verse 10, Finally, after verse 7 said to serve wholeheartedly as you're serving the Lord, not men. So after we've served wholeheartedly, he says, here's my final words. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, not part of it. Don't take it on and off. Put on all of God's armor. Why? Why? so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme because this is a battle that we're facing. The deceiver, the one who wants to kill, steal, and destroy, the one that masquerades around as an angel of light. Am I okay? Just got a bad connection? If I need to change mics, tell me. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For... Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, even in the heavenly realms. We're fighting a spiritual battle in human form. Therefore... Put on the full armor of God. Paul says it again. Don't take it off. Don't put on partial. Put on all of God's armor if you're going to fight this battle. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Sure sounds more like a battle than a football game to me. <clears throat> These are Paul's words, but they also are Jesus' Jesus's words. In some of his final words, he prayed a prayer for the disciples and for the other believers. And here's what he said in John 17, starting in verse 11. I will remain in the world no longer, but they still are in the world. And I am coming to you. 
Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name that you give me, so that you may be one as we are one. So not only am I fighting a battle, but I am fighting it alongside each and every one, and we need to be united for the cause, fighting together, all equipped with God's armor, realizing what's at cost. Verse 12, While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. By that name that you gave me, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that Scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word. Are you reading it? I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is your truth. Set apart them, make them holy, so that the world can see you through their holiness, their distinction, their difference from the world. And you're sanctified by God's Spirit, and you're sanctified by God's Word. Verse 18, As you sent me into into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray for also for those who believe in me through their message. This is a continued battle that has continued on for generation after generation after generation until Jesus Christ returns and takes us home. That all of them may be one, Father, verse 21, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's the purpose. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you love me before the creation of the world. Comforting that Jesus would pray for us, that He would pray to the Father, that He would ask the Father to send the Comforter, that we are fighting a battle, but Jesus did not orphan us. And our destination is already secure because Jesus won this battle on the cross. We've just got to live out our lives for Him, empowered by Him. As Luke says when he started the book of Acts, the continued works of Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. So where is your eternal destiny? Who is your king? Are you fighting the good fight, as Paul would say? Because we are fighting a battle. You're fighting for one team or the other. One Lord or the other. Would you really want to go into battle without any ammunition? Are you reading your Bibles? I am happy to say that some of you have come up that didn't read before that are reading now. Woo! <laughs> My goal as a shepherd is that we're all reading God's Word, that we're all praying, we're all fellowshipping together, just as the example that's set apart for us in uh, Acts. The church hasn't changed any. God's Spirit hasn't changed any. We are the same. We are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this broken world so that we are sanctified, holy, set apart so that others see Christ through us. That through our love and good works, they're like, why would that person do that? How can they get along with these people? How can they love even their enemies? I want to know more about this Jesus that they profess. If we're not living that way, they're going to say... I really don't want to know much about this Jesus they profess because they're hypocrites. Hmm. We fight a spiritual battle. Who are you fighting for? But then persecution comes along, doesn't it? You're down in the trenches in the mud and the death and stench all around you. And you say, I can't go on any further. Yes, you can. You can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. You sang it earlier. (laughs) The battle is won. 
Even if you're taken out of this world, it's a victory. Yes, you can go on because persecution is just letting you know that today looks gray, but if I can get above the clouds, I see the sun shining because the sun has never, ever changed. I'm talking about the S-O-N, not the S-U-N. The S-U-N will burn out, but the S-O-N will never burn out. So in Acts 8, 1 through 4, Merle read these words. You're going to read them tomorrow. Boy, it looks gloomy. And Saul approved of their killing Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and Samaria. Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say, you will be my witnesses? He's scattering them so that they'll take the gospel message. It has to come through persecution because sometimes when the days are sunny like this, instead of us saying, I'm going to get out and do something, we'll sit inside in our easy chair. We'll literally do that today, a lot of us. But it's okay. We can rest today. Don't worry, Barry. <laughs> Go Chiefs. <laughs> but there are so many times in the sunny days we get complacent. The days are the same each and every day a day that we have of breath in our lungs to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to do good deeds so that others will see God through us, whether it's rainy or whether it's sunshine. We have a calling. We are ambassadors. We are aliens and foreigners in this world, united together to fight this battle. Verse 2, Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Now, you already know, so I'm not spoiling anything. That didn't last, did it? Because then Saul single-handedly almost built the church beyond this. Man, how God can use even his biggest enemies. Saul began to the, destroy the church. Going from house to ha house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered... Preach the word wherever they went. Wow, God is a mighty God. He is in control of all things. Don't ever let any problem in your life deceive you because Satan wants to use it to deceive you. God is in control. And if He loves you enough to send His Son to die for you, then He loves you. And He will never, ever leave you or forsake you. So I gave you a devotional also. There's three copies left down here if anybody still needs one. One of the devotionals that you read this week, I'm just going to highlight a little bit of it because this talks about the Christian in complete armor, telling you that we fight this battle. And each and every devotion builds on the other and gives you a little more meat, a little more understanding so that you think more and more and meditate more and more on what your job in this world is and how unequipped we are in our own strength and might, but how that <laughs> we are fully equipped in God because we put on His armor so that we can extinguish all the fiery darts of the devil. And on January 29th, this one's titled, The Object of God's Affections. That's you and me. God loves us. It says, He who keeps you never slumbers, he has fixed his gaze forever and with definite de delight pleases himself in the object of his affection, you and I. <clears throat> when was his ear ever deaf to hear your cries or his hand too short from supply? To better understand the nature of our enemy, let us note the term that Paul uses here. He says that the, uses the word wiles. You'd have that in the King James. All the wiles of the devil or method or schemes. Wiles is used to express the subtlety of Satan in planning his strategy, a military strategy, against the Christian. Because the devil is very subtle enemy, the saint must always be on his guard. He didn't say to Eve, God did not tell you this. He said, did God really say? And if you study that scripture, you'll find out Eve gives us more insight. Because she says, God said not to eat from that. But Eve tells us, you don't read it from God's word, from His mouth, that if you touch it, you will surely die. She knew the instructions. 
but yet she let the temptation to deceive her come in based on her own desires of covetousness and lust, eat the fruit. <clears throat> because the devil is very subtle enemy, the saints must always be on his guard. If Satan was too crafty for man in his perfection in the state that Eve was in, how much more dangerous to us now in our maimed condition? How much we need God's armor on. And how much God loves us that He would give us His armor. Ever since that time, the devil has been increasing his craft. He's been doing it for a long time now. He's getting craftier in his ways. But guess what? If you put on God's armor, you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the devil because you are the object of God's love and grace. <clears throat> Would you lay down your life for Jesus? Jesus asked those words of Peter. We read them. In John 13, verse 33, it says, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I now tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another. Now, John writes later that if we can't love those that we see, how can we have the love of God in us? How can we love God who we cannot see? Do you love your neighbor? Now, I'm looking at just each and every one of you in here now. Now I'm picturing my enemy that lives down the road. That, right? We are to love one another even our enemies, because Christ died when we were all His enemies. When we were fighting for the other guy. When we wanted ourselves as Lord. Yeah, we wanted someone to save and protect us, but did we really want a Savior that came that, came that way, or did we want one that would fight for us in the way we thought, a Barabbas, a one that looked like Christ, but I didn't have to lay down my life for. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. <laughs> that sets a new level, doesn't it? Because Jesus Christ considered nothing His own, nothing to gain for Him. He lived a meager life as the very thing that He created. Wow. Wow. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Verse 35, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you do indeed love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, Where, am I, where I am going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you? I will lay down my life for you. And we know what happened right after that. He denied him. He denied him again even more so. Then he called cursings down from heaven because he utterly denied knowing Jesus. Will you lay down your life for Him? Well, it's definitely something you can't do without the Spirit of God. But with the Spirit of God, you can, but it means that you need to deny yourself each and every day. Take up your cross the persecution that comes, and then follow after Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Verse 38, Then Jesus answered him, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very I tr truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Well, as we're reading in Acts, we see the difference in Peter now. He is laying down his life. His life literally is in risk each and every day, but he doesn't care about his own agenda. He cares about Christ's agenda, and he cares about his love for each and every one, even his enemies. He takes every chance that he can to do good for others and then to give an example of Jesus Christ, a preaching opportunity. In John 10... Because the Pharisees were so blind to these spiritual truths, Jesus said this. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. 
but the sheep has not the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and out, come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Jesus wants you to have abundant life here and now, even facing persecutions. That's what it means. That in those times you can have the peace that surpasses all understanding. That you can have a higher calling. That you can know that there's sunshine above the clouds. That you can know that you're beloved by God. That you are His child. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Will you lay down your life for Jesus? In John 12, 23 to 26, Jesus said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and does die, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is talking about Himself, but He's also talking about the harvest that we can plant by dying to ourselves so that others can live, so that we can train up our children, so that we can teach our friends and neighbors, so that we can even be a light to our enemies to, increase, to grow and increase a harvest. Verse 25, Anyone who loves their life too much to lay it down, they'll lose it. While anyone at the same time who hates their life in this world, they will keep it for all eternal life. 26. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. And in Luke 14, after Jesus talks about who would not sit down and calculate the cost of fighting this battle, going into war, to know if they could win it or not? He says, In the same way, those who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Most times, Jesus is talking about spiritual truths, not physical things. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Unless you give up everything that you thought was important, I consider it all now garbage or rubbish that I may gain knowledge and knowing Christ. Unless you're willing to give all that up, then you're really not going to understand and discover Jesus, let alone what He did for you on the cross. How much God loves you. Your eternal future. What, he, what a privilege it is to be able to be His hands and feet in this world. Who's counting on you to show them the way, the truth, and the life? If you notice in your reading, and you'll notice as you go on in Acts, the people were called people who followed the way. Because Jesus taught them a way of living that was different. Not just a faith to believe, but a faith put to action. And they followed after that. That's why they were called followers of the way. They showed that they were living differently. That the things that did matter before did not matter as much now. And that's why we read in Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves constantly and steadfastly to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, intimately joined together with one another and intimately contributing to the body. They did this to the breaking of bread and to pr prayer, Everyone was filled with awe at, the, awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet with one mind, one purpose, one goal, working for that. They met in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I'm going to repeat that last part. And the Lord added to their number daily who were being saved. Don't you want to say that statement about the ones you love? Then maybe if we live that way, maybe we'll see the Lord adding to our numbers daily. That is the church. That is the first example of the church in action, this way of life. 
Then from this week's reading, oh, persecution comes in, doesn't it? Well, we're not quite there yet. Let's read in Acts chapter 4 first. Peter's arrested, so there is some persecution. And despite persecution, the church grows to 5,000 people. We have a number. People who did not deny Jesus, even in persecution, who did all these things, who met together and prayed even for boldness, for the power of the Spirit to do mighty things through them. That means that I have to deny myself to let the Spirit live through me. And in chapter 4, verse 12, after Peter gets out of prison, he says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which you must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men... Now, what's your excuse? <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. Because so many times, I'm not equipped. I can't do this. It's not my calling. Whatever God calls you to do... And the movie helped us with that because this girl hears an audible voice from heaven and her and she doesn't go to church regularly. And her sister says, I go to church all the time and I had not heard God, but who's to say that it's not true? Follow what you think God is calling you to do. She was not equipped at all, but guess what? God fully equipped her to do the job that He called her to do. We all have gifts of the Spirit and we're all to use them... Not just keep them, but use them, share them with one another to build up the body to achieve the goals of Jesus Christ, the goals that He began to teach and preach, to reconcile men to God. When the, verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter, I'm just going to put him in there because we're following Peter so much in Mark where we did, and they realized that he was unschooled, that he was ordinary, they were astonished, they were amazed, they were perplexed. The same way when Jesus came before Pilate, it's the exact same word. When he was amazed that Jesus would not t stab out to his accusers, that he didn't have a mean bone in his body, so to speak, that he silently went to the cross. Did Pilate understand all that? No. But it amazed him and he marveled at it. Who could this Jesus be? And when they saw this, it amazed them, and they marveled, marveled at this. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They didn't take note that Peter had denied Jesus. They took note that Peter had been with Jesus. And then in verse 21, after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. So you thought persecution was going to break out and destroy us, but yet we've got everybody praising God instead. Later on in that chapter, in verse 23, it says, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They praised God in unison. Now they're praying to God in unison. What would we naturally pray for? Stop this persecution, please, God. <laughs> right? Well, let's read on. In verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They had one mind and one accord. They understood the mission that they were on. They realized that it was not by their power and might and strength. They saw this in Peter, this unschooled, unlearned coward who had become a mighty man of God, learned in the Scriptures and powerful in speech and in action, and he healed because of the power of the Spirit. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. This isn't Peter. This isn't James. This isn't John. This is all the believers spoke God boldly with the power of God that lived and in them and through them. At, when we're in 2 Corinthians, it starts out, well, I don't remember what chapter we're on now, I think we're about to, up to 7. It starts out with the only reason that you can comfort others is because you had to be comforted from God in the first place. And Jesus said, when He said, I won't orphan you, I will send the Comforter. 
if you never knew persecution, if you didn't have the trials in your life, if you didn't see cloudy days, you wouldn't appreciate the sun so much. You have been given the Holy Spirit so that you can comfort others who are hurting and dying in this world because they follow the wrong king. It makes sense to them to choose this antichrist that says, bow down to me and I will give you the things of this world. But that's not God's plan. Their destination is not heaven. And you're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. To live, to shine your light. But you can't do that unless you put on God's armor. If you live by His strength and His power. If you don't deny yourself. If you don't consider the rest of the things of this world as rubbish. Jesus never asked you to die for Him. He said, would you give it all up? Would you lay down your desires for mine? Would you lay down your plans for mine? Would you lay down what you think is even reasonable because it's foolishness to me for my wisdom? Are you reading your Bibles? Are you spending time together? Are you growing in your faith and maturity? When you're falling short, are you asking Him to increase your faith. If you're not growing, then you've at least plateaued, but chances are you could be dying. Spiritually, there is no reason whatsoever that we're not growing to the point where of total sanctification. We will be forever and ever and ever in this place that we're going to go to, guys where there will never be any covetousness. There will never be any greed. There will never be any pain, suffering. And there certainly won't be any death. Why would we not be living for that goal now and drawing other people to that destination? In Acts chapter 5, you saw that God's serious about hypocrisy in His church, didn't you? Two people got killed right there in church in front of everybody in great fear went over the church. It's because God is serious about His calling and His children. You read it in the Old Testament. You know that God's plans haven't changed. That's one reason we read, made sure we read through the Old Testament. Now we're studying the New Testament even harder. Because God, when He sanctifies something and makes it holy, that's what it is. It's for His use and His use only. And each and every one of you have been justified and sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ if you put your faith and trust in Him. <clears throat> Luke, Luke says it twice. In verse 11, he says, Great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about these events. Persecution and fear both led to growth in the church. And in verse 19, after being imprisoned again, it says, But during the night an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people about this new life. New life, not old life, not hanging on to the old. This new way of life where everything else has been crucified with Christ so that I can now live through and by Him. That I am a new creation that I have repented and changed my mind, that nothing else matters except knowing Christ and making Him known. This new way. The captain of the guard went out to go see what this new way of life was about. In verse 32, Luke writes, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Go study that one. Acts 5.32. <laughs> Those who obey Him. Does that mean those who don't obey Him didn't get the Spirit? Does that mean those who don't obey Him really don't have the Spirit? Does that mean that by their fruits you will know them? That if I see you obeying Jesus, what does that mean? That means, yeah, reading your Bible... That means not lying, stealing, and cheating, but doesn't it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? To go and preach and teach the gospel message? Doesn't it mean all of those things? Aren't those commands of Jesus? So won't I know for sure? 
when you're doing that, won't I know even more for myself that I see the fruits of the Spirit living through me so that when my enemy Satan comes to try to deceive me and says you're less than, says you can't do it, and especially says it like in the movie again because her dad's telling her she can't do it or others in the church says she can't do it. She says, no, I'm following God's calling for my life. That you don't let Satan deceive you, to distract you. Instead, you follow after Jesus' commands. You love others. You teach and preach. And therefore, you know in your heart that when Satan comes and gives you those lies, that you say, no, I'm a child of God. Flee from me, and he will depart from you. In verse 41 and 42 of that chapter, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they were counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. That's your example of the church. That's the example of how you should live. That's the example of how and you, you and I should be united and living together. So what's our excuse? I ask you, in closing, to examine yourself. To examine this church. To pray for boldness and mighty power in the body of Christ. To bring unity to the church. Anyone who professes that they belong to Jesus Christ. It means you can't point fingers at your brothers and sisters down the road that are another denomination. That you do go out and love even the least of these. That you consider your money and things not your own, but given by God's grace to be rich to the world. How we can be more like Jesus Christ so that when others see each and every one of us, they will marvel at what they see, so that we can draw others homeward. Will you pray that with me? Will you examine yourself? If you hadn't heard anything from else, hear this altar call, if that's what you want to call it. And will you walk hand in hand by the power of God with me to make a difference in this world? to hear when we get home, well done, my good and faithful servant. Father, we do thank You and praise You that Jesus Christ gave up everything to save us, that He fully equipped us to fight this battle that we wage against Satan and the evil forces even in heavenly realms. They want to distract us, they want to weaken us, they want to take away the power, but our power is your power. Our victory is your victory. Oh, Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ finished and completed the work that you sent him to do by saving us and then going home to prepare a place for us. While you've left us on this earth empowered to do the continued works of Jesus Christ, may we read and study what those words are. May we pray for each other May we use our gifts to build up the body of Christ. May when we see a battlefront that needs addressing, may we pray for boldness to fight the battle that you have given us. Lord, we thank you and praise you. For we do stand in awe of you and the amazing things that you do. Thy will be done and thy kingdom come, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.